Welcome to Church of the Redeemer, whether you're here in person or on Zoom. My name is Haldor and I'm the pastor here. It's a great honor to be worshiping with you today on this Reconciling Sunday, where we celebrate and remember a decision made in this church 29 years ago to be open and welcoming to the LGBTQ community. Chanel is our music director, Cynthia Larson is our liturgist, Thomas is responsible for our tech. Let's listen to an introit performed by the Malcolm Care Peace Bell Choir. Good morning. I'm Cynthia Larson and I'll be your liturgist today. Please join me in the call to worship. And feel free to rise if you're able. The Holy Spirit calls us together as the people of God. Please join me in the opening prayer. Naming God, you sent your beloved child to us to dissolve the binaries between clean and unclean, holy and unholy, human and divine, saved and unsaved, and even death and life. Grant that we, following in your child's footsteps, may see our whole lives as scripture, so the coming of your kingdom may be witnessed in the way we love one another beyond binaries. In the name of Jesus Christ, our companion and protector, amen. Please stay standing for the opening hymn. All are welcome. Verses one, two, and three, insert page two. So flip backwards. I don't know if you're like me, but I've been challenged a little by the bulletin, so it's the page before. <clears throat>
Let's pray the prayer of confession and hear the words of assurance. Giver of life, in the midst of life exploited by greed and abuse of power, have mercy on us. Giver of life, in the midst of life shortened by hate and exclusion, have mercy on us. Giver of life, in the midst of life destroyed by war and conflict, have mercy on us. Giver of life, in the midst of life groaning for fullness and dignity, have mercy on us. Giver of life, you created us all in your image, and we squandered this gift of life. And the whole humanity and creation lamented with us. Have mercy on us. When God created the whole creation, God saw it was good. God loved it and continues to love all. May the giver of life make all things new through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. And now we will hear a poem which Cynthia will introduce. Yesterday it occurred to me that there were some really good poems that we could be sharing on um, our Reconciling Sunday and Pride Sunday. So I went looking and I thought I knew what I was going to find, but instead I found a new poem by a poet named Lee Mokobe from South Africa. He's a trans man. I think he wrote and performed this poem at a TED event in 2015. A few notes on the poem. It's a slam poem, so it's very narrative, um, which you will like, I think. Um, and it refers to three trans people. One is Maya Hall, who was a transgender woman shot and killed by police in Baltimore in 2015. And her story is missing from the news of Black Lives Matter, as many stories of transgender people is are. Another name is um, Leela Alcorn, a transgender woman who committed suicide in 2014. She was a Northeast Ohio native, and her parents refused to accept her and sent her to a Christian-based conversion therapy camp. A third name is Blake Brockington, who is a trans man and an advocate for gender minorities in Charlotte, North Carolina, who was the first openly trans prom king in North Carolina, and who, despite seeming to have had a lot of um, positive and affirmative um, community, uh, committed suicide in 2015. Um, and my last note is that um, I'm editing one line of the poem, and I'm going to tell you why, because it's educational. I hope I've been loud enough. Um, I keep leaning back to look at my words here. Um, there's a line here that refers to someone who used to be on our cereal boxes by their dead name, and we're really not supposed to use the dead name, so I'm changing that to Caitlyn Jenner, because it's more affirming and inclusive. Okay, so on coming out by Lee Mokobe. The first prayer I uttered was in glass-stained cathedral. I was kneeling long after the congregation was on its feet. I dipped both hands in holy water and traced the trinity across my chest, my tiny body drooping like a question mark all over the wooden pew. I asked Jesus to fix me. When he did not answer, I befriended silence in the hope that my sin would burn inside my mouth would dissolve like sugar on tongue. But shame lingered as an aftertaste. And in an attempt to reintroduce me to sanctity, my mother reminded me of the miracle I was, that I could grow up to be anything I want. I decided to be a boy. It was cute. I had a snapback, toothless grin, used skin knees as street cred, played hide and seek with what was left of my girl. I was it the winner of a game that other kids couldn't play. I was the mystery of anatomy, a question asked but not answered, tight roping between an awkward boy and apologetic girl. And when I turned 12, the boy face wasn't deemed cute anymore. It was met with nostalgic ants who missed seeing my legs in the shadow of skirts, who always reminded me that my kind of attitude would never bring a husband home. I swallowed their slurs along with the insults. Naturally, 
I did not come out of the closet. The kids at my school opened it without my permission. They called me by a name I did not recognize, said lesbian, but I was more boy than girl, more Ken than Barbie. It had nothing to do with hating my body. I just love it enough to let it go. I treat it like a house. And when your house is falling apart, you do not evacuate. You make it comfortable enough to house all your insides. You make it pretty enough to invite guests over. You make the floorboard strong enough for you to stand on. My mother fears I have named myself after fading things as she counts the echoes left behind by Maya Hall, Leela Alcorn, Blake Brockington. She worries that I will die without a whisper, that I will turn into what a shame conversations at the bus stops. She claims I have turned myself into a mausoleum, that I am a walking casket. News coverage has turned my identity into a spectacle. Caitlyn Jenner on everyone's lips while the brutality of living in this body becomes an asterisk at the bottom of equality pages. No one ever thinks of us as human because we are more ghost than flesh. People are afraid that my gender expression is a trick, that it only exists to be perverse, that it ensnares them without their consent, that my body is a feast for their eyes and hands. And when they have fed off my queer, they will regurgitate all the parts they did not like. They will put me back in the closet, hang me with their other skeletons. I will be the best attraction. You see how easy it is to talk people into coffins? How easy it is to misspell their names on gravestones? People wonder why there are still boys rotting their girl away in high school hallways. They are afraid of becoming another hashtag in a second, afraid of classroom discussions becoming like Judgment Day. And now oncoming traffic is embracing more transgender children than parents. I wonder how much time it will take before the trans suicide notes start to feel redundant, how fast we will see that our bodies become lessons about sin way before we learn how to love them. Like God didn't save all this breath and mercy. Like my blood is not the wine that washed over Jesus' feet. My prayers are now getting stuck in my throat. Maybe I am finally fixed. Maybe I just don't care. Or maybe, finally, God has listened to my prayers. And I want to say the word of God for the people of God.
The epistle comes from 2 Corinthians thir chap uh, book 13, verses 11 through 13 in the New Revised Standard Version. Finally, siblings, farewell. Put things in order, listen to my appeal, agree with one another, live in peace, and the God of love and peace will be with you. Greet one another with a holy kiss. All the saints greet you. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with all of you. Word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. Now we'll sing the hymn of preparation. Back to all are welcome, verses 4 and 5. Insert page 2. Now I'll read from the Gospel, Matthew, book 28, verses 16 through 20. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. In the year 1054, the largest rift ever in the Christian church took place. The patriarch in Constantinople and the Pope in Rome sent each other letters of condemnation and excommunication, claiming each other to be heretics. The reasons for the schism were many, like in all rifts in churches, but the final straw, or at least the thing mentioned in all history account, was the Latin word filioque, that can be translated and from the sun a word added to the Nicene Creed, probably in Spain, and used widely in churches in relationship with Rome, but rejected as heresy by churches connected to the patriarch in Constantinople. The question, apparently, behind this rift was, does the Holy Spirit proceed from the Father, or does Holy Spirit pro proceed from the Father and from the Son? It took 910 years for the two churches to decide to agree to disagree. In a meeting in 1964, 
they revoked the excommunication of each other. Not that they're working together, but they don't hate each other anymore, apparently. <clears throat> Allow me to pray. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable to you, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. Today is not only Reconciling Sunday for us, but it's the Trinity Sunday in churches around the world, both in the Western Roman tradition and the Eastern Constantinople tradition. Interestingly, having Trinity Sunday on the same day in both churches does not happen every year, not even after 1964. This Trinity Sunday is the day when churches celebrate the triune nature of God, as presented in various church creeds, starting perhaps with the Nicene Creed in 325 and adjusted in the year 381. The lectionary text, the text that Cynthia read earlier, are chosen for this day because of their Trinitarian nature that I'm sure all of you noticed. The second Corinthians talks about grace of Jesus, love of God, and communion of Holy Spirit. And Matthew's gospel talks about baptism in the name of the Father, Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Both texts name the three persons of God, indicating something about what later became known as the Trinity. The Trinity is a fascinating concept, and whenever someone tries to explain it, they fall into a heresy of some kind. There are so many names for so many different heresies related to the Trinity that the number and names of heresies are in itself fascinating. I know that in a Sunday Bible study before worship a few weeks ago, those in attendance tried to use various images and ideas to explain the Trinity. And I'm sorry to tell you and share with all of you and those who participated in that Bible study, <laughs> more or less all of your ideas and images have been claimed heresies by one or more theologians focused on finding flaws in our descriptions of God for the last 1800 years. Attempts to explain the unexplainable can never be fully satisfactory, especially in a church where all things must be rationalized and there is a small room for mystery. I want to share with you here that there happens to be no final correct understanding of the Trinity. The description of the triune God is always going to be flawed, not because it's not real, but because the finite can never fully describe the infinite, which I know bothers some of us deeply. Paul talks in today's epistle about putting things in order and the need to agree with one another, finding a common ground. But first and foremost, Paul talks about living in peace, allowing God of love and peace to be among us, and greet each other with a kiss. Grace, love, and communion are Paul's key words. Even though this is one of the main texts that is thought to be addressing the Trinity, there is no condemnation in the text for those that use the wrong analogies for this concept. Whether you try to use the ice, water, and steam analogy that I know was used in Bible study, or an image of a triangle, whether the persons of God are supposed to be the angles or the sides. Paul's text is not an attempt to be exclusive, but inclusive. It is not about right and perfect understanding, but grace, love, and communion. It is about gathering, living together, being together, loving one another. And if you don't buy into that interpretation that I gave you of Paul's text, I just recently came across three words in today's gospel that I had never noticed before. And you should just know how often I have talked about Matthew 28. But I had never seen three words in the text before 
I think it was probably two years ago, and I had the first feeling someone added this here, but it probably was there all along. The text describes the disciples worshiping and listening to Jesus after the resurrection, but before Jesus' ascension to heaven. The disciples are all gathered around the resurrected Jesus after the crucifixion, after the resurrection. And we have those words, three words, but some doubted. Those are three important words. Even among Jesus' disciples, even as those disciples are listening to Jesus resurrected, some of them doubted. Even as Jesus shared with them the great commission to go out and save the world, some of the disciples just shrugged their shoulders and thought, I'm not sure about this. But even as they doubted, they still belonged. They still experienced grace, love, and communion. They were part of the team, even though they didn't buy into everything. They were invited along. All were allowed to be part of the gang. The questions were not, what do you understand? Or how do you define the Trinity? Or who are worthy of belonging? Absolutely not. They were all invited to belong, to be baptized, and then learn and follow what Jesus taught, or perhaps always doubting a bit. The learning and following was not necessary to be able to belong. This was first and foremost about communion, about grace and love. Churches can be awful at understanding this. And it might apply to us as well. We are a church after all. There are structures in place, paperwork to be filled out, creeds to be said, behavior to be shown, and sometimes we think those structures, paperwork, creeds, and behavior, as important as they might be, are somehow crucial to God. But usually they are not. Never they are. Which brings me to yesterday. As I was participating in Pride in the Clee, or CLE, all different people celebrating their uniqueness together, celebrating God's given diversity with a lot of love, plenty of grace, in a community of God's children, whether they believe in God or not, whether they have doubts or not, whether they are young or old, happy or sad, it explained and showed true community of all. Celebrating and calling for justice towards all, gathering of all, not because we agree on everything, but because we care for our siblings. Because we want all people to be able to live their lives as they are intended to do. If we can only learn to be less like the church of the last centuries, fighting over Latin phrases, and be more of a pride march every Sunday, celebrating life, calling for justice, showing love and grace to all. Amen. The prayer hymn is Praise to the Lord, the Almighty, number 139 in the United Methodist Hymnal, verse 1.
with the whole earth, let us lift our hearts and voices in prayer. For our planet and all creation, O oh God, shield those places in danger. Inspire us to protect the earth. We pray especially for the victims of hurricanes, earthquakes, fires, and flooding around the world. God of love, hear our prayer. For people in our lives and those unknown to us, we pray, those who need healing, care, and compassion, especially the hungry, those without homes, the refugee, and the stranger. God of love, hear our prayer. We pray for those who need hope, for those who feel excluded, for those who are experiencing dysphoria, for all to know they are beloved by God and worthy of love. We pray for all those who hold, those we hold in our hearts and name in silence. God of love, hear our prayer. Be with us, God. Guide us. Protect us. God, creator of all. Amen. As we reflect on our giving to our community and to our church, let's hear the offertory. <laughs> Let's pray the prayer of dedication. God, giver of all things, teach us to render to you all that we have and all that we are, so we may praise you, not with our lips only, but with our whole lives, our duties, our sorrow, and our joys. Amen. God be with you. On the night before Jesus was tried and executed by the state, he dined with his friends, even the one who would betray him. Jesus took bread, broke it, and gave it to his friends. Take this bread, the word made flesh, to feed you to speak words of justice and truth. Jesus then took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to his friends to drink. Take this, the blood of Christ, to quench your throats parched by the forced silence. Let all who hunger for justice eat. 
Let all who thirst for mercy drink. Let this meal strengthen and encourage you. Let this meal remind you you're not in debt to empire. We are to seek the new reality of the realm, the kingdom of God in this world. We are to advocate for our LGBTQIA plus siblings. We are to advocate for one another as Christ advocated for us. His arms outstretched in love for all. God, let this table be the place where the spark of the spirit is ignited to fuel us from this place into the world, embodying a justice and peace, setting the world ablaze. We long for your spirit, O oh God. Come among us, bless this meal, bring the gift of peace on earth. Come, Holy Spirit, come. Let's pray the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Everything is ready at God's table. It's not our table, it's God's. So all are welcome to come.
Let's pray the prayer of thanksgiving. God, your gifts renew us. Through this test of love, may the Spirit make us brave. Make us boldly pursue justice for all and turn gently to the world's pain. Amen. The closing hymn is This Little Light of Mine, number 585 in the United Methodist Hymnal. Receive God's blessing. May the Holy Parent ignite the fires of advocacy in your heart. May the Spirit place the scroll of knowledge on your tongue in tough conversations. May the Son walk with you as you march with your queer siblings. Amen. Go out into the world and shout from the rooftops that all means all. Thanks be to God.